Well, we're in the book of Revelation, and we're concluding what some people would consider unit one of this study. We're concluding a major segment of the book by dealing with the seventh of seven letters to the seven churches, the letter to the church at Laodicea. And uh, so, just by way of, of review for newcomers, or also just to get warmed up here, it's the revelation, that's singular, it's the unveiling. It includes the consummation of all things. It's the only book of the Bible that has a commitment to give you a special blessing if you read it. No other book of the Bible, to my knowledge, has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. There are a lot of admonitions to read the Bible in general. This one says, read me, and you are guaranteed a special blessing. And that's what we're going to claim tonight as we both uh, read and hear. And of the 404 verses of the book of Revelation, there are over 800 allusions from the Old Testament alone. So that's part of the challenge here. The reason it may sound strange to many ears is because we haven't done our homework in the Old Testament. And we'll try to repair some of that as we go. It does present the climax of God's plan for mankind. But that sounds awfully impersonal. Let me say it presents the climax of God's plan for you and me. And uh, thus gets our un uncompromising attention. And let's read the first sentence. It's astonishing how many people who have never paid attention to what it, how it opens. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto whom? Unto Jesus Christ. Why? To show unto His servants things which must suddenly come to pass. And He sent and signified it by His angel unto His servant John, who bear record of the Word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all the things He saw. One of the things we're going to be uh, need to be very conscious of, especially as we go forward in the coming sessions, is to realize John was there. He saw, felt, heard what was going on. It wasn't just some kind of intellectual uh, dream vision or dream state or something. He was there, and, and uh, we're gonna, that's going to be increasingly exciting as we go. But this is the third verse of that chapter I want to highlight, that blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And then we have the outline. In chapter 1, we have the outline of the entire book. John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta, hereafter, or after these things. And the things which thou hast seen, when he gets to the end of chapter 1, is chapter 1. A personal uh, vision, abil uh, 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 ability to, it's, a, it's a physical description of Jesus Christ in His resurrection body. And uh, that's chapter 1. Then write the things which are, and the things that are in existence at that moment, of course, are these seven churches, which we're concluding tonight. And after that comes the things that comes after the churches, metatauta. And that will have many surprises for you. But let's finish the main section that we're dealing with tonight, the things which are, the seven churches. That chapter closes with a, uh, uh, one of the first identities. He, uh, Jesus is explaining some of the symbols that have already been introduced during chapter 1. He says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which thou sawest are what? Seven churches. I want you to notice where they are. They're there with them in chapter 1. They are going to be in heaven in chapter 4. We'll notice that as we go. The seven churches. Why these seven? This is, this is a question that should haunt us as we study the Bible because we encounter probably a hundred different churches in the New Testament period. Why did Jesus pick these particular, uh, this particular group as, uh, uh, to send special letters to? The seven implies completeness, so in some sense, at least in some sense, these seven churches illustrate the, the uh, complete church. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the concluding phrase of each of the letters. And from that we can draw some inferences. There are at least four levels of application of these, uh, of these letters. The first is local. A number of people, including Sir William Ramsey, researched this thoroughly way, way back. And we're astonished to discover that these seven churches in history actually had problems that uh, the letters relate to. So these, they, there is a local, or I might say historical, uh, application of each of these letters, and we'll touch on that as we go. But it also, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's plural. Each letter was intended to be read by each of the seven, letter, each seven churches. 
So in some sense, each letter applies to every church. Don't assume that a given church is all Thyatira or all Smyrna or whatever. Rather, a more accurate perception would be that every church has some measure of each of the seven churches in them. That's a mixture of good news and bad news. And uh, so all seven apply to all churches to varying degrees. But then we also notice that it says, He that hath an ear. How many of you brought an earlobe this morning or this evening? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. In other words, that's about 50%. I better pay more attention here. Okay. <laughs> No, he that hath an ear. In other words, this is also intended by Jesus Christ to be a personal letter to each of us. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there is a homiletic, as some people would say, or a personal application to each one of these. There are lessons for each of us individually in each of the letters, no matter what church we're going to. And so let's keep that in mind. But so far, so good. You say, gee, that sounds like good pastoral packaging. Except there is a fourth level that many would consider very conjectural. And I'm going to present it to you and let you come to your own conclusions. But it seems, and it's held by many conservative scholars, that these seven churches also happen to lay out a history of the church at large. The book of Acts covers about 30 years, the first 30 years of the church. The book of Revelation appears to cover about 2,000 of the subsequent years. And so we'll take a look at that. Now, each of these letters has seven design elements. I always emphasize this for a couple of reasons. One is as we go through any study, one of the things I hope you carry away is an appreciation for the architecture of these 66 books we call the Bible. This architecture transcends any particular book. In fact, it's the integrity of that design that establishes our foundation for our basic hermeneutics, that is, our basic understanding of the Scripture. 66 books penned by over 40 guys over thousands of years that clearly have been designed in advance. There are elements of each of the books all the way through the Bible that anticipate things before they happen, which means the origin, the real author of those 66 books is from outside the dimensionality of time. So we emphasize architecture all the way we go through. These seven letters, there are many good scholars that study the seven letters that miss some of the points because they haven't taken the time to notice that there is a design structure of each of the letters. So we're going to focus on that. There's the name of the church that turns out to be significant, the, t the title that Christ chooses of Himself, and uh, each one of these are a clue as to what is the letter really all about. And there's, a, comp there, and there's a, a report card, the good news, the commendation, then an expression of concern, this is the good news, there's the bad news, and then what should you do about it, the exhortation. These three elements are the core of the message. Accommodation, I know your works and you did this really well. I have these concerns, and by the way, you better do this, that, and the other thing. That's, the, that's basically the structure of the message. Then there's a special little promise to the overcomer, to the individual involved. And each one's different. And then we have this peculiar closing phrase, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now last time, just by way of warm-up here, we talked about the church in Philadelphia. And uh, we noticed that it had seven commendations. I know thy works, and I have set before thee an open door, no man can shut it. Thou hast a little strength, thou hast kept my word, thou hast not denied my name. But the seventh one was, is a real grabber, and that's one reason I want to make sure we include it this time, because it's going to be relevant to our, whole, our total or, or overview. We're going to try to re, real, take an overlook of all of the seven this evening when we finish with the Laodicea. God promises, Jesus Christ promises to the Philadelphians, I will, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That's one of the most important verses for you and me in the New Testament because it will answer a lot of issues. It's a much stronger prophecy than would appear on the surface. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world that will try them that dwell upon the earth. I will keep thee from the hour of the tri uh, tribulation. The word the, in the Greek, there is a definite article. In the Greek, that's very emphatic. I will keep thee from the hour of the temptation or trial. That's specific. The specificity is very, very crucial. That will come upon Israel, Jerusalem? No, upon all the world. And why? To try them that dwell upon the earth, those that identified with the earth. Now, there are many that will argue that, well, that what this really means is that the Lord promises to protect His church through that tribulation. Well, that's bad news for the Gentiles. 
because the only ones protected in the tribulation are certain, not all, Jews. Gentiles in the tribulation are killed. Everyone that, takes, everyone that doesn't take the mark of the beast is going to be slaughtered, beheaded. And they show up in the Revelation. We'll talk about them. No, uh, uh, this is not what it's saying. That's not what Jesus is. He's saying, I will keep you. Not from the tribulation, from the time of the tribulation. He's going to extract you out of here. That's the implication. The earth dwellers, by the way, all through the book of Revelation, we'll be talking a lot about them. They are a distinctive group. They're the people that are identified with the earth. We and I may be here. We're pilgrims. We look for a city whose maker is God. Now, is this removal or immunity? That's the big debate. The word in the Greek to take is ek, out of. It implies removal. And uh, the definite articles of the hour, the temptation, are specific, and that's, that's crucial. Upon all the world, Revelation 6 through 19 is going to emphasize that as we go forward. And the purpose of the tribulation is to try them that dwell upon the earth. And realize that trial, it means that Gentile believers will accept Jesus Christ, commit themselves to Christ under penalty of death during that period. And so let's understand that distinction. Well, we went through each one of the churches. Obviously, each one had a name, and the names were relevant. We won't go through all. Philadelphia meant, it really means friendly fellowship, by the way. Philae, oh, Philae means the, to, to be uh, friendly toward, and, and um, Delphia being the people. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a friendly fellowship is what the term really means. It's usually translated brotherly love, but that's uh, uh, in, in terms of filial affection. That's fine, too. Um, and and uh, the title that Jesus Christ takes in each one of these is relevant. The uh, commendation is there. What was very distinctive about Philadelphia is that it had no bad news. There are only two churches that had no concerns expressed by Christ. Smyrna, in which all he said is just hang in there. And uh, Philadelphia likewise. All good news, no bad. Kind of interesting. Uh, we also noticed, I'll co comment on this, the first three letters had the promise to the overcomer appended to the body of the letter. And the last four will have it in the body of the letter. That suggests the distinctive that we'll trade on when we look at the prophetic implications of this. And so, as we look at the prophetic thing, we have the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And we suggested, because of the nature of the, the structure of the letter, the, the apostolic church, which was very diligent about the doctrine, but had lost their first love. They were shy on devotion. And uh, following that was the persecuted church. Smyrna means myrrh, which speaks of death. And we saw the, the emphasis of the whole letter deals with the suffering church. Pergamus, what Satan could not accomplish by persecuting a church, he accomplished by having the world marry the church. And we have the married church, when the conver so-called con conversion of Constantine and the, uh, the establishment of state-supported churches, uh, Pergamus being the perverted mar marriage, and uh, uh, so on. That leads, of course, to what we might classify or label the medieval church, a church in which we have a prominent figure of Jezebel that uh, we talked about at that time. And uh, if, if the Thyatira is the Roman Catholic Church, as most commentator, Protestant commentators like to emphasize, then they got a big problem with Sardis, because Sardis would be the denominational church, and the summary of Sardis was, they have a name only, and they are dead. So that's a little disturbing to really look at that. We went through all that, that previous time. And then, of course, we have Philadelphia from last time, the missionary church. Everybody, of course, realizes we're all Philadelphians, I'm sure, but uh, don't we wish that really was true. And now we have Laodicea. Let's take a look at it. Oh, by the way, I might point out that um, the first three are distinctive in that the promises are postscripted. The last four have the promises to the overcomer put in the body of the letter. And they also have another distinctive that each one of the last four letters has an explicit reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that would suggest to us then that the, while they all, they, there's a historical profile in, in view here, the last four in some form or another survive to the end. And one of those four, Thyatira, has an explicit comment, uh, uh, comment to it that if it doesn't change its ways, it's going to be cast into the tribulation. The flip side of that is, is that if they do repent, they won't be. So think of that one through. Now, of course, we also had uh, uh, Sardis is en enigmatic. Philadelphia was promised to be removed. So that's our uh, going in position here. Let's talk about some other things. We, now we're going to talk about Laodicea. So the church at Laodicea is our primary target tonight. Let's jump in. This is where the seven churches are. I've labeled them here. I've got Patmos with a little circle around it there near the center bottom. Athens to the left, Istanbul up in the upper right, and it gives you a perspective of Asia Minor. 
uh, that uh, these seven churches were prominent in. And of course, we are in the seventh of those, Laodicea, which is some 40 miles southeast uh, of uh, Philadelphia by distance. It's in a very key road system uh, to the rest of the province, so it's going to be a very prop, uh, prosperous place. The, the history of this uh, uh, little town goes back to 2000 B.C., small town and so forth. About 19th century, the Hittites added to their empire about 900 B.C. It was captured by the Phrygians and soon afterwards by the Lydians. That brings us to the, the time that most of these others are around. About 250 B.C. It was taken by the Syrians, that is the Seleucid Empire. Antiochus II rebuilt the town and named it after his wife, whose name was Laodice. And uh, so in 190 B.C. it became part of the kingdom of Pergamos, ultimately passed in the hands of the Roman Empire. And according to Josephus, by the way, there was a large Jewish colony there, which fits a lot of the things we'll talk about. But the economy is important to understand. It's going to be important to understand the letter. We need to understand the economy of Laodicea. It was a city of merchants, bankers, and refiners. It was at a junction of roads leading from Ephesus and Smyrna. So most of the wealth in the region would pass through Laodicea to the, to the inland. A, they had caravan trade as far east as the Yellow River in Punjab by the China Sea. It's hard to imagine this. You, know, you don't think of these early days as being that, you know, prolific. Uh, but we do know that the, at, at Stonehenge in, in uh, Great Britain, they enjoyed commerce worldwide, strangely enough, in, in way back in the Bronze Age period. So anyway, the economy here was substantial. In fact, Cicero held court there and, and did his banking there. Now there was an earthquake in 62 AD that devastated the city. But one of the main events of that period was that the wealthy citizens of Laodicea built it without getting help from Rome. In several of the other cities that had problems in the past with earthquakes, Tiberius or whoever would extend support to help rebuild it. And in gratitude, those, those uh, cities would uh, adopt, uh, you know, uh, uh, ways of celebrating uh, the Caesar. Here, because the wealthy citizens did it themselves, it's pretty obvious that they get driven by pride. They're wealthy and had need of nothing. This is the Beverly Hills of the district, if you will, or whatever. Tacitus uh, in his annals talks about this. So they are known for their prosperous neutrality. See, it was never militarily defendable, so its posture was always one of compromise. They're sort of like the Switzerland of the area, if you will, okay? And uh, they were, uh, they were uh, a, it was a very highly successful commercial center. And there is to this day remains of aqueducts, baths, gymnasiums, stadiums, other things, all testify to its early luxury. The principal products are worth mentioning because they will echo in our letter. One of the main things they did there was textile manufacturing. It turns out they were well known for a breed of sheep that had wool that was incredibly soft, very, very glossy, and it was black, unusual for sheep, of course. So they, had, they merchandised a form of black wool for both carpets and texture, uh, textiles and so forth, and uh, that uh, was, w w was very famous. Another uh, aspect of Laodicea is they had a medical school there that was well known for an ophthal ophthalmic ointment. It's some kind of mixture of oil and uh, calurium powder that uh, even uh, Aristotle makes reference to it and calls it Phrygian powder. Phrygian would be the general area, but the specific place that it came from was Laodicea. I mention this because Jesus is going to make reference to this presumption. The people on the street all understood this, that uh, they obviously knew their primary, one of their primary manufactured products was this black wool, and the, uh, the, the eye salve that was merchandised was known all over the world. It apparently had some kind of properties that would uh, bring relief to all kinds of eye problems. The water supply. Laodicea is part of a three-city, uh, a tri-city area. There's Colossa, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, all within three, four, five miles of each other. And uh, at Laodicea was near Hierapolis, which is six miles away, renowned for its hot springs. Hierapolis was. But the, by, the time, but by the time the aqueduct gets it to, and by the way, the Turkish government is trying to harness some of this geothermal power. But the point is, by the time this water got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. See, it was midway between Hierapolis and the cold waters of Colossa. So the lukewarm, the warmness is mentioned. You know, you and I, when you drink, if you have hot water, that tastes good. It's, it's weak tea, so to speak, or something. Cold water is obviously drinkable. Either hot or cold, you can deal with. 
Lukewarm water is an emetic. It makes you want to spew it out. And, that, and Jesus is going to use that as an idiom that's widely misunderstood. We'll get into that. And so the main point is that uh, Laodicea is known for... Now, when you visit Laodicea, there's also some chalk cliffs and there's some waterfalls that have sulfur water. And it also is lukewarm, but it's, it tastes bad. But that's a different issue, too. People, they'll, they'll always introduce you saying, that's the, that's the lukewarm water I mentioned in Revelation. I don't think so. I think the lukewarm water in Revelation is, is water that's lukewarm, not sulfur water, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, the uh, church history. It possibly, the church in Laodicea may have been founded by Epaphras because there's a reference to him in the letter to Colossae. And uh, Paul also addressed a letter to Laodicea that has not been preserved. It may have been a circular letter. I mean, a lot of these letters were intended to be circulated among the churches. And the epistle of the Ephesians may be that letter, but that's speculation. Paul's first letter to Timothy was written by him from Laodicea. And uh, it intrigues me that many commentators say Paul never visited Laodicea because they misunderstand another remark he made. He obviously did because he wrote Timothy from there and says so. But anyway, there's also a tradition that Archippus, who had become, uh, had, was the bishop of Laodicea, because some 30 years earlier Paul warned Archippus that, uh, to be more diligent in his ministry. That's in Colossians chapter 2 and chapter 4. And one of the things that I want to get across here is Colossae and Laodicea are so close, they are instructed to exchange letters. And so, so many people, the, the letter to Colossae also deals with issues that, of Laodicea and vice versa. But um, in any case, the weakness, the apparent anticipated weakness of Archippus may have been one of the reasons why Laodicea is not a strong church, as we'll so soon find out. So let's jump into the letter. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, the Laodiceans right. Now the word, again, let's start with the name of the letter. Laodicea means people, right? Remember the Nicolaitans, the rule over the people. Here we have people as rulers. This is ruled by the people. Some people say, gee, it's a word that sort of suggests democracy. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the real point is, who is supposed to be ruling the church? I haven't heard anyone give me the right answer. The Son of God, you betcha. Jesus is to rule the church. Uh, there's no instruction that I can find in the Scripture for us to do, uh, you know, market research and do user-friendly. I, can't, I, I, I noticed John the Baptist didn't worry about being a user-friendly preacher, but we'll move on. Uh, the title of Christ. This is, now, Jesus takes of himself, then, uh, in each of these letters, a title typically drawn from chapter 1, one of the, one of the seven elements there. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. There's three epithets here. Um, and uh, the, uh, it, it's interesting how Jesus just draws upon His foundational character. He's going back to basics here in this letter. He is the Amen. That's a word, that's a Hebrew word, by the way. It means true, verily. And uh, we find it all through the Bible. We also uh, find passages where uh, it speaks of that which is true, and often the amen isn't necessarily at the end. We use it like a salutation at the end of a prayer. No, sometimes right in the middle of, um, of Paul's letters, he'll say the you know, amen, you know. And it's also a style in many fellowships that when, you find, when, the, when the speaker says something that strikes a responsive chord, we get a spontaneous amen. And uh, that's a style that uh, is, is, is not unscriptural. But it means true, verily. It, Jesus Christ is the one, the true one. The, amen. He is the faithful and true witness. Both these phrases, by the way, are drawn from chapter 1. But they also echo throughout the whole Scripture. And I was originally going to go through some of these, but I don't think I need to for this group for two reasons. First of all, this is basic. I'm assuming most of you either have or can track down these verses to get a flavor of what uh, of, of these uh, the foundational character of Jesus Christ, but I also want to preserve some time because I have a, something I want to do at the end to wrap this all up, and we'll run short of time if I take too much time with this area. So, the beginning of the creation of God. This is a very strange expression to many, and uh, so, uh, G -G, Jesus wasn't created. What does this mean? The word um, arche is uh, really uh, means beginning or first origin or first cause. It's also an allusion for the ruling power or the authority. It's, the, it's an allusion to the Creator who began the creation of God. And uh, so the term is used of rank and honor. 
one of the reasons that wanted to catch your eye here, this is a very unusual construction. It occurs here in Laodicea, and it also occurs in the letter to the Colossians. And uh, I'll come back to that before we're through this evening. And uh, Paul had specifically instructed both Colossians and Laodicea to trade letters, and uh, because the, 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 the Gnostic errors were emerging about that time throughout that valley, and those letters, as well as Ephesians, are rebuttals to the Gnostic error. They deal with the, the, the deity of Jesus Christ, and so forth. Now, we then come to the concerns. Uh, did you notice something missing? There are no commendations. Normally there's the commendations first. There aren't any. I, saw, I was going to insert a little blank page just to make that point, but you get the idea. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold nor hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, there are a lot of people that try to figure out, well, gee, that means you should be either cold or hot. And, uh, and, and it's, it's kind of fun to read some of those attempts to apply that because, uh, well, gee, then the, the ones that are lukewarm must be the carnal Christians. Okay, then uh, who are the ones that are hot? That he w doesn't, you know, and who are the ones that are cold? And you start playing with that, it doesn't work, okay? And I don't think that's, what, that's the point at all. What Jesus is using is he's drawing an idiom from the local scene to point out that they need to be palatable. If they're lukewarm, he's going to spew them out. Can you imagine Jesus saying of you, I'm going to spew you out of my hey, that, That's as about as, re, that, that sounds like rejection to me, I think, yeah, okay? And uh, so, I know thy works. That you can't hide from God. It, this, this, this echoes in each of the letters. And uh, so, here, Jesus is saying, you guys at Laodicea are like an emetic. I'm going to spew you out. And uh, uh, not everyone, let's go to Matthew 7 to give you an echo of this. Not everyone, Jesus says, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name ca have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? What will Jesus say? He says, that I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So this is obviously their rejection. And Jesus goes on to amplify that in verse 17 of chapter 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. By the way, do you realize, you know, I don't, many of you probably watch Christian television, and there's a number of these guys that um, are on the air that uh, are sometimes called the name it and claim it guys, the blab it and grab it guys. You know, God wants you to be wealthy. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Watch your news to Paul. Um, the uh, God didn't intend you to be sick. You should be, if you're sick, it's because you don't have enough faith and all this, you know. So um, I never realized that those guys that preach that way on television are scriptural. Do you realize that? Sure, they're right out of Revelation 3, verse 17. They say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Really? And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And I'll forego the temptation to give you a 17 Bible verses on each one of those to track down. You can do that on your own with things. But basically, obviously, this is, a, this is another example that we see all through the seven letters where the perception of the church was wrong. The churches that thought they were doing poorly were doing well. The ones that thought they were doing well were doing terribly. That should be sobering to every one of us. Every one of these churches needed a perspective of Jesus Christ, needed to be corrected in that direction. So what's Jesus' exhortation uh, in response to all of this? He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And it was not the kind of gold you're trading in. He's using it idiomatically, of course. That thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. He's not talking about white wool either. He's using that as an idiom, of course. That, your shame, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Now these are idioms that are, were familiar to the local uh, people. Because he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. So the remedies, their blindness and nakedness were not incurable. He says you're blind, wretched, and so on. 
He suggests the ultimate refiner offers his gold. You find that in Psalm 19 and all through the scripture. The, the re, we saw we sing the refiner's fire and so forth. The bridegroom offers his covering, white raiment, not the blossy, raven-colored, black uh, wool, if you will. And the great physician offers his remedy to really open their eyes with, he says, eye salve. He's using it idiomatically. He's not the eye salve. He's talking about, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, so they can behold and see. Then we get to verse 20. Now this verse is a verse that is probably one of the most quoted verses out of the book of Revelation. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. How many have heard that verse before? Sure, we all heard it many, many times, typically by an evangelist at an altar call. Be Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the no door and knock. And indeed he does. And if any man, any one of you, Mr. or Mrs. Man, Hear my voice and open the door. The door has only, the knob is only on the inside. Okay? Open the door. I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. I love that phrase. You know, Jesus never appears after his resurrection without eating. This is one of the examples. But anyway, uh, my kind of guy. I will sup with him and he with me. Now, taken out of context, this is a great invitation. The kind of invitation you use for an altar call, get people to come down and make a decision for Jesus Christ. Praise God. That's exciting. However, where this verse stands is the final indictment of the church at Laodicea. Why? Where is Jesus with respect to the church of Laodicea? He's outside. We had introduced in chapter 1 and echoed all through the chapters 2 and 3 that Jesus has the churches in His hand and He is in the midst of them. Jesus is in the midst of us right now, praise God. Not here. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And say, the, pro the commitment here is not to the church. It's to that individual that just might hear and receive Christ. In spite of the church, not because of it, is my suggestion. Then he has a promise to the overcomer. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Wow. Is Jesus on His throne right now? No, He's not. That says a lot here. I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in His throne. This should clarify some confusion about Christ's throne. Christ was promised a throne. Gabriel told Mary that He would get a throne. What throne was that? David's throne. He's not on David's throne today. He never has been. He will be. He's on His Father's throne. We're going to talk a lot about thrones next time, because the next time we meet, we're going to go into the throne room of the universe, and we're going to see firsthand what's really going on there. So if my Father in His throne, that's next time. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And here we have the, the salutation at the end. That he that hath an ear phrase has occurred seven times in the book of Revelation so far. It also has occurred seven times in the Gospels. And we're going to examine where shortly, in just a minute. But let's remember who the overcomer is. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So, okay, we had Laodicea's name, the title, their concerns, exhortation. Obviously, there's something that's scathingly uh, omitted. There's no commendation whatsoever for two of the um, churches, Sardis and Laodicea. Strangely enough, it would be the two that most characteristic, characteristically describe the churches today. And I don't just mean in America. You think we've got problems here? You should go to some of these other countries where they used to have a dynamic church and today they're empty shells of formalism and, and totally devoid of the Spirit of God, it would seem. Okay. There is an inscription on a church in Germany that I couldn't resist using to wrap up Laodicea. This inscription appears apparently on a church in Germany, at Lübeck, uh, Germany. Thus speaketh Christ our Lord to us. You call me master, and obey me not. You call me light, and see me not. You call me way, and walk me not. 
You call me life and choose me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal and seek me not. You call me noble and serve me not. You call me gracious and trust me not. You call me might and honor me not. You call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. That to me says it all. Well, we said there's a number of these. I'll review the prophetic thing, the prophetic profile. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And of course you have the apostolic church, the persecuted church, the married church, the medieval church, the nominal, denominational church, the missionary church. Where are we today, it would seem? Can I call it the apostate church? How many pulpits can you go to in America where you never hear the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin? You have lots of drama, you have lots of modern music, you've got uh, lots of interesting things. Um, you have churches that are purpose-driven. I thought sheep, sheep were led, not driven, but let's move on. The first group have the promises to the individual postscripted. The last four the promises to the overcomer are in the body of the letter. And they also make explicit reference to the second coming. So we have the medieval church that has a promise that they, if they don't repent, they'll be cast into the Great Tribulation. We have the missionary church, Philadelphia, promise that they will not go into the Tribulation. And we have two that are ambiguous that will leave to your own suggestions, the denominational church and the apostate church today. All these churches apply, all these letters apply to all churches. Let's remember that. Let's not pin, you know, uh, labels on any particular church. Like Ephesus, of course, the issue there was devotion, not just doctrine. They were doctrinally sharp, but they didn't have, too busy on the, t uh, uh, on the business of the king to have time for the king. Smyrna simply endure persecution. That's the persecuted church. And it, while I believe it does refer to Smyrna in that in those early centuries under Roman persecution, there are more Christians under persecution today than ever before in history, in numbers. There are more Christians murdered in the 20th century than all the previous centuries put together. Pergamos, the married church. There are many churches beside the Vatican that are married in one way or the other to the world. Paganism is everywhere. And the, the, we are to stand fast against the world as a church. Thyatira is also told to abandon pagan practices. They had the woman Jezebel and all of that. Sardis, they were dead. We're admonished there for watchfulness and diligence to make sure that does not apply to us. Philadelphia, we'll call it the missionary outreach, evangelism. And I think the model of that in the coming decade is the home fellowship, as it always has been. If you don't want to know what I mean by that, get our briefing package called the Once and Future Church. I think there, God has always puts new wine and new skins, and the, the, I think we're going to see wine now being put back in the kinds of skins they were way, way back then. Around, there's a groundswell of home fellowships, and that's the, that I think the Lord is preparing the body to go underground. And then, of course, we have Laodicea, which for lack of a better term, I'll just say prosperous compromise. They compromise with the world because of their prosperity, and that's an affliction that affects us all. We all take comfort, too much comfort, in riches and our wherewithal and so forth. You say, well, gee, I'm out of a job right now. Yeah, but you're still better off than most people in the world. Let's talk about the personal application. That was the church application. Ephesus involves neglected priorities. Smyrna, satanic opposition. You may not be being persecuted like they were, but is Satan opposing you? Probably is, if you're relevant. <coughs> Pergamos, avoid worldly compromise. Thyatira, flee pagan practices. Sardis, watchfulness and diligence. For Philadelphia, I think it's loyal ambassadorship. That actually echoes through all of these. And Laodicea, repent and be committed and not drifting under the, a false security of your denominational label or whatever. Okay, I, we're, we have a little time to wrap this up. I'm going to take a summary of the seven letters from a very surprising place, from Matthew 13. And in Matthew 13, we have uh, Jesus making a presentation. He opens up by telling a parable about the sower and, the, and four soils. You've all heard sermons preached on that. 
He also talks about why he preaches in parables altogether. Then he explains the sower and four soils parable. He apparently gives the, the parable in public and then explains it to his disciples in private. Then he talks about the tares and the wheat, the mustard seed, the woman the leaven. Then he brings them privately and he explains why, some more about why he talks in parables. And then he explains the tares and the wheat. And then he adds three more, treasure in the field, the pearl great price, and the dragnet. What I'm going to do here, see, the, there's two parts that the sower and, four, the sower and four soils is made in one place and explained a little later. He explains why he speaks in parables in two different places. I'm going to bring these together, I'll show you in a minute. The tares and the wheat is, 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 is between verses 24 and 30. It isn't until verse 36 that he explains the tares and the wheat. Do you follow me? So what, and then, there, then he gives you five others. Now what I'm going to suggest we're going to do is we're going to take the parable comments together first to understand what he's really driving at. And then we'll take the explanation of the sower and the four, so, uh, four soils behind the sower and the four soils. And then we'll take the tares and the wheat explanation behind the tares and the wheat. So what I'm going to do is rearrange those in this order. Follow me? All I've done is reshuffle it so we'll be dealing, dealing with, we can go at, it, go at it with a little more efficiency, if you will, because this is just a review. It's not intended to replace your studying of these uh, seven parables. But uh, let's take the first one. Why parables? In verse 10 of this chapter, he says, The disciples came and said unto them, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. What? That's backwards. No, it isn't. In other words, the parables aren't to explain something they wouldn't understand. It's to make sure they don't. You've got to be kidding. What's he talking about? Let's go on. See, so answer that. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto, to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he, that, and she, he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. See, what Jesus does... He gives you a little bit of truth, and depending on what you do with that truth, He'll give you more. If you disparage or don't use it, He takes away the little you had. A strange principle, isn't it? But that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Parables are packaging to, to uh, uh, give preference to the people who are looking at it through the Holy Spirit. Therefore I speak unto them in parables, Jesus says, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are full of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Wow, that's pretty wild. There's, a little, there's more coming. Later on in the chapter, he also says, For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. We're going to discover that uh, when you get to near the end of the chapter, Jesus is going to say, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. By the time you get to chapter 12 and they accuse him of doing his miracles by Beelzebub, from that day on he speaks publicly only in parables. That's what it says right here. He, without his parable, he, we all know he spoke in parables. You don't realize that he, didn't, he only spoke to them in parables. Why? That it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. Get this, a very important phrase. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Wow. The subject of these parables are things that you will not find in the Old Testament. It's not like he's illuminating something from the Old He often does that too. But these things, he says, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now what secret in the Bible is conspicuous, the primary secret, that was kept out of the Old Testament and revealed anew? And Paul it's his privilege in Ephesians chapter 3 to tell us about it. Paul says in Ephesians 3, starting about verse 4, Whereby ye, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and, by, and prophets by the Spirit. What is that secret? That Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The secret is not that Gentiles would be saved. Isaiah is full of that. 
No, the secret is this mysterious entity called the church. One of your most important studies, as you learn in your Bible, is not in eschatology, it's in ecclesiology. To understand the mystery of the church. It's not just a group of believers, it's much more than that. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. Okay, so that's the why parables part clustered together. Let's go to the first, uh, first uh, parable He gives them, and we'll also look at His explanation of this one. He spake many things out of the parables, and saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the side, and fowls came and devoured them up. First soil, we're going to talk about four different soils. First soil, they, uh, they fell by the way, and birds came and took the seed away. Remember those birds, it's going to be important. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And this, when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. That's the second soil, right? Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And other fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Boy, there's an interesting phrase. What a trigger, huh? Um, so obviously we have the four soils. Now, interesting, you notice the fruit bearing of the fourth soil was a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. There seems to be a decline. I think that's kind of interesting too. So later on in the, in the chapter, he will explain, when they're privately, he'll explain that parable to them. We're not guessing here, he lays it on them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed, the seed by the wayside. That first soil then is a failure in a sense because the seed is snatched away by whom? The birds. How do the, who are the birds? In that, what, what do the birds represent? The evil one. Strange. Let's remember that. There is a principle in hermeneutics that the scholars call the principle of expositional constancy, a fancy phrase for simply saying that there's a tendency of the Holy Spirit to use idioms consistently. That's all it really means. But then he contrasts the first ground, but he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receives it, yet he hath no root in himself, and he, but dureth for a season, for a while, and when the tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. So some that just don't hang in there, don't get it. He also that received the seed among thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. So that takes care of three of the four, doesn't it? Each one slightly different, all of them are not fruitful. But he that received the receive the seed into good ground, that's a condition of the heart, in other words, is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So we don't have any problem with the four soils. You've heard, you've heard sermons on that, and, and, and they, they should have pr pretty much been on track. Okay, so that one's explained for us. That's great. You see, three of these are explained, the others aren't. That's the problem. Then we get to the next one, the tares and the wheat. Another parable he put forth in him, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. And while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Okay? Now be careful here. The sower in the parable is asleep. I'm not going to suggest... I think the sower is the Lord, but I don't think he sleeps. So don't, don't, this is an example where you can take an allegory and overwork it. You know, he that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So, uh, now by the way, tares are a Zanzania uh, seed that's prevalent in the, in the Israel area. And uh, while it's growing, it looks just like wheat, but it later turns, when it matures, it turns black, which is its true color. If it gets mixed up with the wheat and you make bread with it, it's poisonous. It's poisonous. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence cometh it hath tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said to him, well, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? No, he said. Nay, lest ye, while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say, The reapers gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them 
but gather the wheat into my barn. So that's pretty clear, isn't it? So Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares in the field. Okay, good. He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. See, that you notice it's exactly like the first parable. Same idioms are being used. Again, the sower is the Son of Man in each case. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. See, the, and the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Seem fairly straightforward? Okay. And he goes on to explain, and therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the Son in the kingdom of the Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. There's that phrase again. He that hath an ear. Interesting, huh? Now, because of this, the post truth guys, see, this shows that the, the bad guys are going to gather first and then we. It doesn't say that. It's summarizing. But uh, if we didn't have other uh, illumination, I could see them come to that conclusion. Okay, so we have this one explained. So far, so good. Now we get down to the mustard seed. Now, the several of these now are just little one verse jewels that are without explanation. And I have heard more preaching on the next several that are absolutely contrary to the Word of God, I believe. Another parable he put forth on the saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greatest among the herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Well, that's how I've heard many people say, you know, it's the Word of God, it's, the church is going to grow, and, 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 and everything's going to be wonderful. Um, the problem is this. When you visit Israel, as you drive in your buses, you'll see the hillsides full of these yellow flowers. They're about a foot, foot and a half, sometimes maybe two, three feet high. That's the mustard seeds. The seed is the tiniest little seed. And they normally grow to two or three feet high. Have you seen the birds rest in bushes two or three feet high? Not very often. This particular one becomes a tree that's so big that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches of it. What's not obvious here, unless you live in Israel, is that this one is weird. This one is grotesque. This one has become a tree it wasn't intended to. It's such a nice tree that guess who is resting in the branches? The birds. Well, wait a minute. Who are the birds in, in per first parable? So if you're looking for ministers of the evil one, don't overlook the pulpits. Don't overlook the pulpits. Okay, let's, let's move on. Let's see it. Let's, let, let's take a look at another one. This is probably even more important. The woman and the leaven. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. That's all he says, and there's no explanation. But remember, he's a Jewish rabbi talking to Jewish disciples. Leaven is always an idiom, both Old and New Testament, for sin. It's used emblematic. That's why Passover, that's what you have to understand. For Passover, it's, it's all important. The, the leaven is a symbol, uh, idiomatically, of sin. Why? Because it corrupts by puffing up. That's why God hates pride. It's the source of all sin. Well, in this case, a, a woman who's making meal, that's usually what they did the first thing in the morning, they ground the meal for the day. The, here we have the kingdom of heaven is like, a, a, like, is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And I've heard preachers preach that, gee, the leaven is like the Word of God, and if you just put a little in there, pretty soon it'll all be great, you know, and so forth. No, it's just the opposite. If you're Jewish and you hear this, you gasp in horror because three measures of meal from Genesis 18 on becomes the symbol of the fellowship offering. The three measures of meal. Why three measures? Because you had the Lord and two angels visit Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. And, and Sarah made the, the, the three measures of meal start uh, from there. And so uh, the, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. If you're Jewish, you gasp in horror. You don't put leaven in the fellowship offering. Come on, you know, until uh, the whole was leavened. Well, I'll come back to this as we go. Let's take a couple more here. The treasure in the field this is another one. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field, uh, the which when a man hath found, he, uh, he, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buys that field. And that would be the man that's buying the field is not the believer who's discovered Christ. 
That's the way it's sometimes applied. No, 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 no. The field was what earlier? The world, right? Within that world, a treasure is hidden, and it's so precious that he gave all that he had to buy it. Who's doing the buying here? Jesus Christ is doing the buying. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now, the next parable is, sounds like the same thing. Let's take a look at it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Sounds like a similar a parallel situation, doesn't it? Not exactly. There's another problem here. Oysters are not kosher. Jews do not prize pearls. They may trade in them with Gentiles because it's profitable trade, but they themselves don't prize pearls because oysters are not kosher. Here's a case where we have an idiom that's drawing on a Gentile idiom in a sense. It's like merchant man seeking goodly pearls, and when he's found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Why is this one different than the previous one? See, oysters are not kosher. Well, uh, let's take one more and we'll come back and take a look at this another thing. Well, let me d not leave it. Let, let me explain this one. The pearl is unique among jewels in that it is a response to I irritation. It grows by accretion and then it's removed from its place of growth to become an item of adornment. Boy, you talk about and it's a Gentile jewel. You want an idiom of the church, that's a dandy. That's a dandy. Well, let's go, and then the last one is the dragnet. This one is explained, and it's in the very verse that's given. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but the bast they cast away. And so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from them among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of the fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay. Now, by the way, <laughs> we have right at the end, some people think this is a, you know, an eighth par uh, uh, a parable. I think it's just a figure of speech we'll see here. Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? Now, let's take the tally. You know, they, they, he explained three of the seven, right? And we are left to sort of guess about the other four. Jesus said, have you understood all these things? The disciples said, yay, Lord. I could punch him. <laughs> could, you, could, you, could you just explain those other four, please? Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. So there's a mix of old, old and new here, but some of the things are obviously the new secrets. So let's take a look at these seven kingdom parables and let's lay them against the seven churches we just went through. We have Matthew 13, we have the sower the four soils. We could argue that's the early church. We have the doctrines that we talked about being introduced, Gnosticism and Caesar worship, the other things, the tares and the wheat. Then we get to the mustard seed, which grows so big that it even allows the birds of the air to come in its branches. Does that, like, does that sound like the church when it gets married to the world and we have the state churches? And then we get to Thyatira, which is prominent because of the woman Jezebel introducing false doctrine. Then we have the fourth kingdom parable where the woman is introducing leaven. You see a parallel here? Some people don't. I do. I, you know, it's a, see, if you do, great. Sardis, the treasure in the field. Philadelphia, the pearl of great price. Which one of the churches is the rapture church? Philadelphia. Which, which of these idioms emphasize the rapture, I think, idiomatically? The pearl of great price. And of course, Laodicea is the final cleanup, and that's what the dragnet's all about. So there's Pergamos. I think that one really fits especially well. Thyatira, the woman of eleven. Philadelphia. The others, I'll let you chew on and, and come to your own conclusions. I think they fit, but uh, I, I, I don't want to oversell this. But I'd like to give you one more. You ready for this? Paul wrote some epistles. Did you, you, how many knew that? 30%. Huh? Boy, we're in trouble. Romans, 1st and Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and Thessalonians, 1st and Timothy, Titus, Philemon. I won't, I won't quarrel with Hebrews right now. That's a whole other story. But the point is, these are the ones that are usually attributed to Paul. It's interesting that three of them are pastors, right? Timothy, Titus, Philemon. That means he wrote ten others. Three from thirteen is... And we, anyway, we have now seven churches, right? That's kind of interesting. Paul wrote seven churches? Is it possible that Paul's letters would fit the seven churches of, of, uh, of, uh, of Jesus in John, in Revelation? Well, 
The first one's pretty easy if we want to list Paul's. I think Ephesus would fit Ephesus. We're okay so far? <laughs> okay. Is, now, Smyrna was the suffering church. Is there a letter of Paul's letters that particularly focuses on joy through suffering? Anyone? Okay. Then we get to Pergamos, the one married to the world. Is there one of the churches that Paul wrote that was the worldly church? First Corinthians, good for you. Or Corinthians, yes, you betcha. Okay, Thyatira. Um, uh, uh, is a call out of religious externalism, Galatians. We have Sardis. I'm going to look for the definitive gospel, the gospel according to Paul, the definitive statement of doctrine in the entire New Testament, Book of Romans. Is there one of the epistles that's uniquely tailored to the rapture, to the second coming, Thessalonians? That leaves you one left over that happens to be in the same neighborhood and is instructed to exchange the Laodicea. Now, are these intentional or are they accidental? You'll never resolve that debate. You'll either look at that and say, wow, isn't that interesting? Is that a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit here? I think it is. It's not so convincing as to be a proof of anything. Don't misunderstand me. I share it just for your own sensitivity as you read the Scripture. Don't, to just never lose sight of the fact that the real author isn't Paul or John. It's the Holy Spirit. And from time to time we encounter things that would certainly seem like the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. So, okay. We've been through the, the main section, second section, the seven churches, chapters 2 and 3. We're now going to go to the things which shall be metatauta after these things. The word her hereafter is metatauta after these things. And when you get to chapter 4, verse 1, John says, after this, the word there is metatauta, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Imagine that. Does that sound like uh, some of Paul's epistles? I think so. Talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be metatauta. And we're now at, the, at a watershed point. I believe that the church at this point is behind us, and we're going to go forward uh, to see those things that happen after the rapture. And we're going to see it from the throne room of the universe. Now, a few verses later, you'll also incur, uh, occur in verse uh, 5 of chapter 4, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Now, the lamps of fire were introduced for you in chapter 1. What were they? What were the lamps? What were the lampstands? The churches holding the Holy Spirit. So we have both in view here, but they're in heaven, in the throne room. Kind of fun. Okay. So for the next session, I'd like you to read two chapters. I'd like you to read chapter 4, and you'll be treated to being in the throne room of the universe. I also want you to read chapter 5. It's a short chapter. We'll probably take them together if we can. And I also want you to do some background, if you get a chance, there's a four, little sh four-chapter book called the Book of Ruth. I'm going to suggest to you, you will not understand chapter 5 unless you have studied the little four-chapter book of Ruth. And the question, your exam question, so to speak, for next time session, who are the 24 elders? You can prove who they are, and it's going to be one of your most, it, it, very controversial, I understand that. But we'll show you why we believe you can clearly identify who they are. They identify themselves quite well. And uh, we're going to talk about that. But uh, it's going to be one of the most important things of the session. And the question that goes with that, then why is that important to you and I? And I think it's going to be very, very important to each one of us. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Well, Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this time together. We thank you that you have given us this appointment. And we know that there are no accidents in your kingdom. We pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in this appointment. Father, we need the searchlight of your word to shine into our own hearts as we reflect on the seven letters to seven churches. Because we do understand they're written. Each one of them is written to each one of us. 
We pray, Father, that the lessons not be wasted, that we might understand, perceive, discern what it is you would have in our lives that need a corrected set of priorities, that there's baggage we need to shed, that there's things we need to put behind us, that there's things that we need to stop, and there's also things that we need to begin. Father, we do seek devotional time with you. We do pray, Father, that you would help us understand more thoroughly what you would have of each of us personally in the days ahead as we commit ourselves without any reservation to be your ambassadors to represent you before a pagan and dying world. Help us, Father. Give us that discernment. Give us that resolve. As we do commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.